Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Loftus, and Mark Raycroft. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed podcast. We've got myself, Ron Hayes, Jason Loftus, and special guest coming to us from Texas, Hector Astorga. Welcome, Hector. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You bet. I know, Jason, you've been out and about uh, doing a little chasing. I've been out and about doing some scouting um, for an upcoming project. Jason, what? Uh, without getting into too many of the details... What have you been out doing? Yeah, I've been out uh, getting, I've had probably three pretty good trips since the last time we caught up. So we'll save the juicy morsels for the <laughs> the catch-up episode coming up. So everybody tune into that. Um, but yeah, I got out to the Tetons and Yellowstone and chase some lizards around. Um, always enjoyable to get out. And, you know, as we've talked before, that's how I kind of, you know, straighten or clear my head and uh, center myself. So it's been nice to be able to do that. Absolutely. And Hector, we know you're out all the time. We've been trying to do this for a little while now, and uh, <laughs> you're a busy guy. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Staying busy. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, for sure. We'll get into a little bit more of that later, too. Uh, but Hector, the way we like to start these out, uh, just to kind of loosen up the conversation a little bit, is to tell us about your favorite ever outdoor experience. Okay. Oh, Oh wow, that's that's a tough one. I've um, I've been an outdoors person pretty much my whole life, uh, and when I moved to Texas back in my teen years, I fell in love with the South Texas brushland. So uh, I've been hunting, fishing, hiking, camping, photographing pretty much, uh, you know, since since a teenager. Uh, but if if I had to pick one, uh, I would say out of the most recent ones would probably be my times with the mountain gorillas in Uganda. Um, Uganda holds, uh, you know, a, a pretty good spot in my heart in terms of photographing because I really enjoy photo photographing in Bwindi. Uh Just the whole experience of photographing there, not only, you know, not only the gorillas, but, you know, it's hard to get to. It takes a good while to get to them. Uh, you spend just a limited amount of time with them. Uh, there's very few left, you know, in the wild, very few left in the world. Uh, the whole experience, if I had to pick one, um, I would probably pick that one. I'm very blessed that I get to photograph in some phenomenal places, and I love everywhere that I photograph. But if I had to pick one, I would probably pick Uganda. Interestingly enough, you're not the first person to have that be their favorite, and, and I'm I'm not surprised to be honest because it's it's a pretty intimate scene once you get to where the gorillas are. Correct. Correct. You know, and uh, it's like like I said, you know, it's the whole experience. You know, it's hard to get to the once you get to to them. You're allowed a very limited amount of time, only one hour a day with them. And then once you start spending time, you know, uh, with them, you realize how similar they are to us and how they react and how they act. Uh, it's 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 definitely an experience that if anybody has ever the chance to do it, I would definitely suggest to do it. As a wildlife photographer, for me, it's by far my favorite, you know. Now that it says a lot to be honest, because you do get around, um, you've got tours all over the place. Tell us about, well, before we get into that, <laughs> how did you get started with a camera? Okay. Uh, as a teenager, I, I was born and raised in Honduras. I'm originally from Honduras. My, uh, my family, Central American on my dad's side, on my mom's side, my family's from Texas. That's how I ended up here in Texas. Uh, but growing up in Central America, my father was a photographer, a hobbyist, and nothing serious. And my dad was not really a wildlife photographer. My father was a you know photographer in general. He had his own little dark room, and he just played with it. And uh, early in my teens, you know how it is. You always try to copycat what your parents do, and I wanted to do what my dad was doing, so I kind of got into it then, but nothing serious. And then... Of course, I grew up late teen years. The camera went away. Uh, other interests came about college and, you know, moved to the States, college and all that. But uh, 
like I said earlier, you know, I, I've been an outdoors person my whole life. Uh, so when I started looking into photography again, back in 2007, when I started getting serious, it was basically an extension of my outdoor activities. I wanted to do something else, you know, outdoors. I was not hunting as much anymore. I was uh, still fishing, uh, but I was getting up there in years. You know, I had a family. My daughter was already born. And uh, so I kind of got into it, you know, then, you know, kind of just another extension of the outdoor activities that I was doing. Here in South Texas, there is a very well-known uh, photography competition run by the Valley Land Fund, which has been around for many, many years. And actually, I was doing some work for one of the birding centers, and the exhibit was up for the one of the previous years, you know, competitions. And I asked them, you know, where, where were all these images taken? And they said, oh, these are all taken here. And I said, what do you mean here? And they said, here, here in South Texas, here in, you know, in, in the four counties that make up the Rio Grande Valley, which is where I live. And I was just blown away that all all those images were taken in this area, you know, uh, where I live. So that kind of got my interest going and that kind of how I just hopped on and, uh, you know, started getting into it. Then a couple of things happened in my life. I got involved with the Santa Clara Ranch, which is a photography destination here. And that was a huge catalyst for me. Once I started guiding and receiving photographers here, when we first started, we were very small. You know, maybe I think our first year we hosted maybe 15, 20 photographers the whole year and probably 10, 12 of them were our friends. Uh, now, you know, fast forward till today, we're hosting over 400 to 500 photographers every year here at the ranch. Wow. Uh, photographers from all over the world, you know, uh, of course, mostly from North America, but we get Europeans, uh, people from Asia, South Americans, uh, Central Americans, people from Mexico. So we're hosting just this uh, huge number of photographers and uh, bringing them to photograph here in South Texas. Uh, that kind of was a catalyst for me. And then I started traveling for my own photography and people that I met at the ranch would ask me, hey, when are you going to take a group out there? We see that you were just in, uh, you know, I don't know, Chile. And I was like, well, you know, at the time I was like, no, I really don't do that. I, I mean, I, I just, the only place I guide is here. But the request kept coming. More and more people wanted to travel with me. So back in, I believe it was 2012, I decided to do my very first out-of-state you know, trip with clients. And that was to Bosque, Bosque de la Pache, New Mexico. I picked a place that I knew well and that it was easy. So I went to mm -hmm. Bosque and it went very well. And I said, you know, there, there might be something here. So I did one that year. Then the year next year I did two and three and four. I'm up to 17 a year in um, Europe, Africa, all over South America, Central America, and of course the U.S. and Canada. So... Yeah, it's it's wow. it, it just cascaded from wow. one trip a year to what it is today. <laughs> and I suppose you kind of get a you, you kind of get in the flow. Yeah, you know, but it's, it's, that seems like a lot of work. It does, it does. But uh, you know, um, I am gone quite a bit, uh, but also I'm very busy here in the spring. So most of my trips are in the summer, late summer, winter, fall. That's when we're not busy here because our busy season here in South Texas is the spring when I have all the photographers coming to, you know, coming to the ranch. Um, so, uh, you know, we make it work uh, and uh, it's uh, it sounds like a lot, but uh, I do a lot of back to back trips. So because, you know, I, I believe in very small group uh, photo trips. So my groups are small, six photographers tops, most of them. And uh, what I do is I'll do, you know, I'm, I'm in Costa Rica already. I have a demand, you know, more than six people want to go. So I'll do two back-to-back -back trips since I'm already down there. So it makes it easier to, uh, to you know, instead of me traveling down there twice, I'm already down there. I'll do one group and then I'll do a second group. And that has worked well for me over the years. So that's what I do in a lot of places I go. Uh, most of the international spots I go, I do two back-to-back -back trips, you know, every year. Um, so that's made it easier, you know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You don't have to... You don't have to be traveling as much as correct. Yeah, correct. that makes a lot of sense. I'm already down there. Might as well do two groups and then come home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at your 
looking at your website, it's incredible, man. The amount of destinations. I mean, you said seventeen different, seventeen different trips or seventeen different destinations. Well, no, seven, seventeen different workshops. And workshops. Again, some of these okay. two, for example, I do. You know, out of these seventeen, two are in Costa, three are in Costa Rica, two in Africa. Same locations, just that I do two back to back photo tours. I understand. So I'm doing, I'm doing seventeen uh, trips in total. Of course, some of these are repeats. Yeah. Uh, but destinations, I would say, I have. Uh, Costa Rica, Colombia, Chile, Finland, Uganda, Kenya, Canada, U.S. I have uh, eight different destinations where I go. Wow. And I change them. Every year I change them. I have a lot of repeat clients. And uh, so every two, three years I change stuff around and I bring new stuff in to keep you know people interested and uh, also to keep me interested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that yeah. way I you know, you, know, uh, you know, get out of the same grind type trips. And also, of course, it makes it fun to go to new locations. Um, so every two, three years I'll change different locations. I'll, you know, I'll leave a location for a while and then go back to it maybe later on. But bringing new locations because, again, I do get a lot of repeat clients. So um, – I have to keep things new and keep you know newer things popping up so clients you know stay interested. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Ron, I don't know where you're headed, but maybe while we're on the workshops, we can talk a little bit more about those in detail. Sure, sure. You bet. Yeah, you bet. So, so maybe just just and really just for the listeners, because I'm if you go to Hector's website and it's it's HectorAstorga dot com, and you can see all of his tours and workshops and that, and there's more details about each of these out there as well. So we don't need to go through all the details. But, for example, if, if somebody were to book the spring Texas Birds and Wildlife Photoshop for you, with you, I mean, kind of what does that look like? How do you structure it? Um, you know, what, is, what do they expect to, to experience and see? Sure. Basically, what we do on that one, that's the one that I've been doing the longest because that's the one that I do here. This, that's the local one for me. I'm home in the South Texas workshop. And I'm at the ranch, which is my home base. Uh, that that photo tour slash workshop, I like to call them tour slash workshop because there are truly truly are educational type trips. Uh, we, you know, it's a it's a total teaching type environment while we're photographing. Also between photo shoots, where you know I teach composition, I teach workflows, you know all the different things. Uh, I have time for people. Sometimes will ask me, hey, do we, we want to learn about a specific thing? So there's time to learn about that. Uh, but it's three and a half days of uh, shooting here at the ranch. We're using our blinds that are set up for photography. So we do two photo shoots every day, you know, one morning, one afternoon. Uh, we go out early, early to take advantage of, of course, you know, the good light, the golden light early morning. We shoot all the way through. The light gets harsh, usually about 10, 30, 11, you know, in the day. Then we'll break for lunch. After lunch, we'll have some kind of uh, presentation uh, either on workflows or in composition uh, people asking me about how to process an image or, you know, different things like that. Then the afternoon, we go back out at uh, usually about 3.30 this time of year. And we shoot, of course, till we run out of light. Uh, so we'll do two photo shoots every day. And in between, of course, we'll be doing different uh, different presentations, different things. At the end of the trip, at the last day, we do have a sharing show where people bring in images that they got throughout the, you know, throughout the, uh, the sessions. And we'll discuss them, we'll critique them, uh, and, uh, you know, kind of go about, you know, what you did right, where you could improve, you know, what I'm looking for. Uh, I show some of the images that I captured the same time that they were capturing so we can compare notes. And again, just make it as a full type of learning experience. Uh, these workshops are small. I only take four people at a time. Um, that way I have a lot to one-to-one and everybody is in one blind idol. I don't split the group up and I'm with everybody, you know, 100% of the time while we're, while we're out in the field. And also, of course, when we're in the classroom type environment, when we're in the guest house. So very small group, a lot of one-to-one, great interaction. Great Tex-Mex food. You know, when you come to South Texas, <laughs> we, we, this is the hotbed of Tex-Mex. So we feed everybody great Tex-Mex food here at, our, at the ranch. You know, all the South Texas type cuisine. So it's a great experience all around. We do three and a half days of, of photography here. Um, um, again, this is probably the workshop that I've been doing the longest because this is home for me. And uh, when I first started, I did one in the month of May. Next year, I'm doing five in the month of May, you know, five sessions, because, again, the popularity of them has really taken off. This wow, year was yeah. the first year I did four. Next year, I'm doing five. So um, it's it's a, it's probably one of my most popular tours. And, again, it's because this is my home base. This is this is home. Yeah, and, and just so you, in case you all were wondering, 
if you want to consider doing this, you probably ought to go think about getting booked as soon as you can because yeah, walking through the tours, out. almost everything <laughs> sold out. Yeah. yeah again, you know, <laughs> I'm very blessed that uh, that my trips all sell out and uh, they usually sell out at least a year, 16 months ahead of time. Uh, again, I had to add a fifth session this year because the, f- the four sessions that I offered sold out in a matter of a month or two. So I just added a fifth session and it's starting to fill up already for next year. I was I was surprised to see so Tour del Pain has become it's become very well known to go down and photograph the puma. Yes. But yes. I was surprised to see on your tour you had some penguins also. Yeah, I like to mix it up a little bit. I like to go a lot of people go in in uh in spring, you know, our springtime which is the end of their their spring they're going into the winter. I do it the opposite. I go at the end of their winter when they're beginning their spring. Um for two reasons. One, there's less people. Uh, two, the activity in terms of Puma is the same regardless of what time of year. So you're not going to, you know, there's no difference in, in, in terms of activity for the, you know, for the cats. Uh, three, we get to go to Magdalena Island and photograph the uh, Magellanic penguins that are arriving to nest. And um, so that's part of the trip. So we do that when the first day, you know, that you get there kind of to get your bearings. You know, you just had a long flight out there. So we do something easy, which is basically take a short boat ride to the island. We photograph the penguins for about two hours and then we're back. And that's kind of just to get everybody's bearings, get, you know, get past the jet lag. And then after that, that's when we really start, you know, with uh, with the trekking with the cats the following day. Uh, we also do some landscapes on that trip because, again, you can't go to Patagonia and not do landscapes. I mean, it is just right. flat-out gorgeous down there. So, uh, you know, we, we chase cats all day, but if there's a good landscape opportunity, of course, and if we have the time, uh, we will we will take advantage of it. And then on the last day, I also take uh, clients to a condor roost. We do the Andean condors as they're coming back to roost off this uh, cliffside. Uh, and uh, you don't realize how big a condor is till you're, you know, 20 feet from it. And you realize, oh, my God, that's a big bird. Um, so it's a little bit of everything. And again, you know, our main our main target, of course, is the pumas. Uh, we we don't actually trek in the park. We trek in the lands that are adjacent to the park. It's all private land. Uh, and the pumas are very habituated. So uh, last well, we didn't go last year because of COVID, but year before last, you know, during their four four days of trekking, we saw probably I don't remember exactly, but maybe seventeen, eighteen cats, and we Good photographed grief. nine of them very successfully. Some of them, you know, ten, fifteen yards away. So uh, it's always been um, it's always been a great uh, experience and um, great photography. You know, when it comes to the you know to the pumas, uh, I remember the first time I went. You know. Again, like you know, like I said earlier, I've been an out- <clears throat> excuse me, I've been an outdoorsman my whole life since I came here and you know to to the U.S. Before I went to Chile, I had seen one mountain lion in the wild, and it was backlit about a hundred yards away. We we thought it was a bobcat at first. We didn't even know it was is a, a mountain lion until we got up and we saw the long tail, and we saw it for maybe four seconds, and that was it. It was over. So when I went to Chile for the first time, I was expecting, you know, yeah, we're going to see the cats, but they're going to be 100 yards away, 70 yards away, you know. Never have I imagined that I was going to be 15, 20 yards away from them. And uh, they look at you like you're not a threat to them. Now, these are totally, totally wild cats. Of course, these this is not a, a game farm by no means. I, I, I would never do anything like that. Uh, but they're just habituated and they, they, they have so much food with all the uh, guanacos and all the others, you know, all the other wildlife that's there that they don't see you as a threat and they don't see you as a, as a food source either. So um, it's, they're very easy to photograph uh, and, and in some excellent conditions, too, because it's kind of like a sagebrush, sagebrush type environment. So if you get low, you can get some really nice angles, some really good backgrounds on them, you know, kind of open type uh, habitat. So it makes for some great photography. That's outstanding. I mean, you are very well traveled. What is your favorite destination then? You obviously you talked about Uganda. Yeah, I would say Africa. You know, uh, Africa in general. If I had to pick one, Africa is unique. Uh, and as a wildlife photographer, you you know, Africa is the mecca for for wildlife. Uh, I do Uganda, and I also do Kenya. Um, and um, I would probably, you know, if if I had to, if, if you would tell me tomorrow you can only go to one place from now on, I, I say I'll go to Africa because there's so much to photograph, so much to see. Uh, 
so unique. Uh, you know, the the amount of wildlife that you see at the game reserves in Kenya is just phenomenal. Um, you know, the cats, the uh, you know everything. You know everything. It's um, it's it's again. If if you're able to do it at least once, I I always tell everybody. You know, if you're able to at least go once as a photographer, as a wildlife photographer, you have to go experience Africa because it's an experience of its own. Uh, now we have some fantastic stuff here in North America, and there's some fantastic photography in Central and South America, where I'm from. But uh, Africa, it's on a category of, of its own. Yeah, I don't know of very many photographers that it's not on their list, on their short list. But. Uh, not, especially if you're a wildlife photographer, you know, uh, it's 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 an experience that you have to have at least once. The problem is, once you do it once. You're gonna want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> now, for me, that's that's Alaska. As soon as I got back, I was just waiting, chomping at the. Oh bit no! To and Alaska is but... phenomenal. That's what I'm saying. You know, we here in North America, we have some phenomenal places. Uh, you know, you, your guys' backyard. You know, in the Tetons and, and Yellowstone, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, so I'm not saying that uh, we don't have great places here or in other places. But again, Africa is just in its you know in the category of its own, I guess. And it's just because of the amount of wildlife and what you get to see and the diversity of everything that you get to see. I'm just trying to make myself feel better. (laughs) Alaska is great, though. (laughs) (laughs) I'm very excited for the first time I get to go. But it just, you know, and, and with resources, some resources dwindling, some doing very well, you always... Or I always contemplate, you know, what's what's going to be around for a long time and try to base my decisions on or my priorities on those species that I think, you know, I might not have the opportunity to photograph forever. And so that when I look at Africa, it just seems like it's managed very well. It seems like those those species are, you know, pretty much in equilibrium. There's still poaching issues and different things like that over there, but it seems like wildlife is is very abundant and has been and will continue to be. So maybe I'm wrong. You've been there quite a bit. Uh, what have you seen since you started going there as far as trends? You know, it, it's gotten much better. Um, but there is still some, you know, some... The poaching, yes, it still occurs. Uh, what I get to see more, for example, in Kenya and also in, in, in Uganda is more, not really poaching, but more wildlife-human conflict where, for example, a elephant, you know, leaves their reserve, goes into a town and starts destroying the crops. And, of course, the people go out there and they poison the elephant because, again, the elephant is destroying the crops. So you do see that, you know, that the elephants get poisoned, they get here with a poison, you know, get hit with a poison spear. But it's not really a poaching issue. It's more of a conflict issue. I do see that in Kenya. There is still some poaching around, of course, uh, unfortunately. Um, but they have controlled it. You know, there is a lot more control now than, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. Um, there are some animals that are in danger. Um, rhinos, for example, are, you know, are very endangered in some parts of, you know, of the continent, uh, pretty much all over the continent. Um, in Uganda, the mountain gorillas, the, the Ugandan government, the Rwandan government also, you know, mountain gorillas are in Uganda, Rwanda, and the Congo. Uh, Rwanda and Uganda have done a phenomenal job in protecting them. And, uh, I actually, I'm, you know, people ask me all the time, is like, you know, you don't mind paying $600 to go, you know, because a permit to see the gorillas in Uganda is $600 for the day, for one hour. So it's not cheap. In Rwanda, it's $1,500. Same thing, for one day, one hour. So it's not a, it's not a, a inexpensive permit. But I'll be honest with you, this means that now the gorillas are a good source of income for, for these countries. And that means protection. They're going to protect them because they're not going to want this to go away. I'm sad to say that it's economically, but, you know, but with the money that they're they're able to collect now because the demand to see the gorillas is ginormous. I have to book my gorilla, you know, on a non-COVID year, I have to book my gorilla permits at least 16 months ahead to make sure that I get them for my clients uh, because the demand is, you know, they sell out. Uh, so the amount of money that they're making, of course, makes for conservation, uh, creates a Bewindi National Park, basically supplies the money for every other national park in Uganda. 
that's how much money they make, you know, in, at Bewindi with, with their permits. So I'm okay with them charging what they're charging as long as it's going for conservation and as long as it's helping with the protection of these animals. And it is because, again, you know, the money goes for conservation. The money goes, goes for better resource. And, again, it's, it's a little sad to say, but they are a money-making, you know, thing for them. So they're not they're going to protect it. If the gorillas goes away, all this money goes away. So um, it's 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 conservation, you know. I'm not I'm I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but you know the conservation is being done because of the amount of money that they're making with the you know with the permits. So I'm okay with, with the permits being as expensive as they are. Yeah. Um, um, the money and the demand from the photography side provides enough funding that it helps keep the conservation correct. side going and active and correct. protects the, and the again, animals. You know, they're going to yeah. protect them because they're not going to want this, you know, figure, you know, they, they sell probably, I think in Uganda, there's uh, 12 families that get visited 12 times eight people per family times 600. And they sell out every day. Add that up. <laughs> it adds up to a lot of money, you know, so they're not going to want to lose that. So, uh, so by, and so that means, that means protection for the animals because they're going to protect the animals. And I'm okay with that, you know, as long as the animals get, I think it's a win, win, win for everybody because, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the government wins because it's a source of income for them. We as photographers or, or wildlife enthusiasts win because we get to see them and we get to photograph them. And the most important one, of course, you know, the wildlife, you know, benefits because the habitat is preserved, they're protected, the poaching stops. So it's a win, win, win for everybody. So I'm okay with it. Yeah, and not to mention the positive impact on the local and local economies there. Oh no, definitely, the definitely. folks locally. Brad Josephs was a guest about a year ago, and um, Brad talked about the same thing and the same benefit uh, as far as the snow leopards in the Himalayas. And you know, the ecotourism wasn't there. There was always the climbing tourism. But the ecotourism wasn't necessarily as a big deal in those areas. And now that they've created and given a value locally to the snow leopards, they've had a lot more luck in increasing the numbers and reducing, uh, you know, mortality for the snow leopard population. So it exactly like you're talking about, it doesn't really matter where it is. Um, there can be economic benefit enough that it does aid in conservation. I, you know, and then you have the converse of that where like Michael tends to say, you know, sometimes we love our resources to death and we overpopulate and over impact certain areas and it, it negatively impacts wildlife or can. So there's a, there's a balance to be found. So Hector looking through your portfolio, you, I mean, the bird life that you have is just incredible, first and foremost. Um, what other species do you – I mean, now you're getting out. A lot of that probably came from the ranch, and I know a lot of it came from Central America, um, a lot of the, the exotic species that you have. You're, you're kind of expanding out. Do you feel like you've conquered the birding world? <laughs> oh no, no, not even <laughs> close. <laughs> uh, I started here in South Texas and uh, in in deep South Texas, and um, birding down here is is ginormous. Uh, I live in the Rio Grande Valley. From my house to the border is literally nine miles. That's how close to mm -hmm. the Mexican border I am. Um, so the Rio Grande Valley has been a birding destination for decades. It's one of the hottest uh, birding locations in the U.S. So, of course, when we started photography down here, birds has always been top for us. You know, when you come to the ranch, 70% uh, of what you photograph is birds. And we have species that are unique to uh, South Texas, that the only place in the U.S. where you can see them is here. So, when, you know, when I started photography down here, of course, heavy, heavy on the birds. But of course, we also have white-tailed deer, bobcats, uh, javelinas, uh, you know, you name it. You know, we do have quite a bit of uh, mammals, reptiles, uh, different things. So we, you do get a, a good variety of, of things here, but of course, heavy on the birds. Um, 
I photograph any any kind of wildlife. To be honest with you, um, macro, you know, feathers, fur, <laughs> you name it. Um, from from um, from everywhere I go, I always you know try to see what you know. For example, when we go to Central America, for example, I started going to my home country, Honduras, and I've now moved my operation to Costa Rica. Um, of course, kind of the same thing. You know, they're known for their birds. Uh, you know, you have all the tropical birds. And um, so we, you know, when we go to Costa Rica, we, we it's target heavy on the birds, but we also do rainforest frogs. We do, uh, you know, tropical snakes like fur lances, eyelash vipers. We'll do, uh, you know, fruit bats at night because they're abundant. Um, you know, so we, I try to keep the variety, you know, there for clients, for, for it not to be just one single thing that we go for. Uh, I would say that the only trip that I have that we that is really just just birds would be my Colombia trip, and the reason is because the birds in Colombia are phenomenal. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen an ugly bird in Colombia yet. There's not <laughs> there's not one that's not colorful or unique or 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 rare. I mean, it it is it's it's undescribable how good birding in Colombia is. So when we're there, we're too busy with the birds. We can't do anything else. Uh, yeah. But uh, but no, I try to diversify. And personally, I love to photograph everything, you know, especially since I started going to Africa seven years ago. And I fell in love with photographing mammals, with photographing cats and all the different things. So me personally, um, I like I said, I, I don't have a, a, a favorite uh, in terms of either birds or mammals or anything like that or, or big game or game animals. I, I photograph everything, you know, including macro, including macro subjects. Yeah, and and don't forget the one of one of Ron's high on the list uh, critters that he wants to photograph. Oh, the yeah, Irish yeah, Viper. Costa Rica with me. He, he mentioned it. I know. I <laughs> I've talked to three or four people who do trips down there on the podcast, and it comes up every time. I love those snakes. Yes, They're just oh, gorgeous, beautiful gorgeous animals. We, we photograph all three different colorations of them down there. You know, we have the mossy, the the yellow, and then the green one. I love the yellow. It yes. just stands out against that canopy. That's right. Um, and the the sloths also are they intrigue me. Yeah, you know, uh, sloths are you know they're they're such a unique mammal, and uh, I uh, we we every chance we get when we're down there with sloths, of course, we take it. I truly mm -hmm. truly enjoy photographing sloths. Uh, we see them on both the Costa Rica itineraries that I offer, so uh, they're always high on the list. And it's funny because people people that email me or call me, you know, you know, they see everything that's on the website or they see the the trip offering, but they'll always call me. Hey, are we gonna see sloths? You know, it's always a big target for everybody. So I said, look, yeah. you know, I can't. It's it's wildlife, right? I can't guarantee it, but we're at locations that sloths are abundant. So yes, we have a good chance. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Kauai. Kauai yeah. a little bit more difficult, but yeah, uh, at one location that I go to, actually, after a while, you're like, okay, you got to leave because <laughs> they come in and they don't leave, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> and they start messing with the bird setups. <laughs> oh, so uh, but no, it, it depends on where you're at, you know. <laughs> yeah, that would be a challenge if they start interrupting your because what your focus you focus probably a lot on hummingbirds down there because there's. We do quite a bit, yes. Uh, in, in Costa Rica, we do uh, different elevations. Uh, we do, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I tend to do uh, both uh, multi-flash setups for hummingbirds and also natural light setup for hummingbirds with clients. And I do it at different elevations because the, the species change depending on the elevation that you're at. For example, in Costa Rica, we do it at three different elevations and we get to photograph about 13, 14 species. In Colombia... Crazy. It's about 38 species that we get to see and photograph, you know, in the different elevations. I'm telling you, when, if you want to photograph birds, you got to go to Colombia. It is, it's undescribable. It really is. Hmm. And uh, the beauty of the country is that it's in its infancy in terms of ecotourism. It's very safe now. Uh, Colombia has a bad rep, but it's it's 100% safe. I wouldn't be going there with clients if I didn't feel comfortable. And... Uh, they have the infrastructure that we photographers look for in terms of photography, you know, setups, good purchase, good backgrounds. They understand light. They understand, uh, you know, I don't want to hike three hours in a, in a rainforest and photograph a bird backlit with twigs in the way. 
they understand about having a good perch, a good background, you know, shooting from decks, shooting from blinds. So uh, it's it's Colombia is going to become a mecca for bird photography here pretty soon. Hmm. That's interesting. I honestly have never thought about going on a photography trip to Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, just keep an eye out. You'll see. Give it a couple more years. It's going to become a mecca, it, 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 especially for bird photographers. I mean, there's other photography, you know, in Colombia. And of course, the wildlife is abundant. But the infrastructure is in place for bird photographers right now. It's uh, it's super easy. And the amount of wild and the amount of birds that you can photograph, it's it's indescribable. It's it's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I, I'm intrigued by the the amount of different stuff you get in your South Texas workshops. I mean, I can tell, you know, um, some of these javelina images you have are just, I just think they're cool as heck. And some of these birds, um, different quail and things like that that are fighting and all kinds of stuff. You just got some really neat opportunities down there as well. So. Yeah, no, South Texas is, South Texas is very unique. And the beauty of South Texas is we're, you know, three hour flights from most of the country, you know, uh, and it's easy to get to. You're still in the U S so, uh, it, and, and again, the photography is very good down here and I'm not just saying it because I'm down here or because, you know, I'm part of the Santa Clara ranch, but we have created, uh, you know, especially what we do at the ranch where we, all of our blinds and all of our setups are set up to optimize photographic conditions in terms of, we look at backgrounds, we look at light, we look at foregrounds, we look at uh, water features, and everything that we build is built with photography in mind. We're very unique that we're the only ranch in the state that I know of that the only operation is photography. We don't ranch it, we don't farm it, we don't hunt it. Uh, we're not big, we're 300 acres, which for Texas is very, very small. Uh, but we're very unique that the only operation that we have at the ranch is photography. So everything that we've built, everything that we've done is to optimize photographic conditions. And it shows in the images that our clients come down here and get, you know, here at our place. Um, hmm. Our blinds are sunken three feet in the ground. So you're sitting comfortably in a chair with your lens at water level without you having to be on the ground pot, on the ground pot on your stomach. I mean, everything that we've done is to to optimize the conditions and to make it easy to get, you know, good images. So Hector, what what is the species that eludes you or the opportunity that eludes you that you would like to, even if it's just for yourself? Is there anything that you haven't done that you would like to? Something that I haven't done that I would like to, snowy owls. Oh, I haven't had the go. chance to photograph snowy owls. I know a lot of people, it's like, snowy owls, really, Hector? <laughs> They're like, yeah, <laughs> I just, I've just never had the opportunity. I'm either tied up somewhere else or when the opportunity comes for me to go somewhere, I just can't go. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, 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 it's definitely high in my target, in my target list of what I want to photograph and, and photograph well. It's, uh, I, I tell everybody, I need a clone. I need a clone so I can send the clone to go, to go, to go to yeah. the, do the stuff that I want to do because I'm so tied up with us, you know, with other stuff. But, um, it, I would say in North America, my, my, um, not nemesis because I just haven't had the opportunity to do it, but. I really want to go photograph snowy owls and I just have the opportunity to go do it and do it right has just not occurred for me. So, so Hector, tell me, tell me about the ranch a little bit more. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm we're focused on South Texas, but where is it at? And is there opportunities for somebody like me that if, is maybe in the area and wanted to come and do a day sure. of worth of photography? You know, what does that look like? And are there opportunities okay. for that kind of thing too? Yeah, we're we're located in, uh, like I said, in deep South Texas. We're in the Rio Grande Valley, so you can't get much more south than us. We're we're at we're at the border. The ranch itself is about thirty five miles north of the of the river, uh, in rural Star County. The closest uh, big city or the closest airport would be McAllen, Texas. And from the McAllen, Texas airport, you're about fifty five miles, you know, from the ranch. Um, the ranch is 300 acres of pristine native brushland. Uh, our habitat down here is Tamaulipan thornbrush. So we're, you know, thornbrush, ac you know, accent on the thorn. <laughs> Everything here has thorns. Everything um, wants to stick you, bite you, poke you. So yeah. <laughs> everything. There's not a, there's, I don't think there's a single plant that doesn't have thorns down here. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're thornbrush habitat, a very arid type habitat or, our 
average, not this year, this year has been nuts, but average rainfall is about, you know, 20 inches of rain a year. So we don't get much rain. Uh, so the way we've done it at uh, here, the way we do it here in South Texas is when we build our blinds, of course, we have bird feeders and different things to attract the birds. But the main attraction is the water hole that's in front of the blind. The water is what brings the animals in because water is in short supply down here. So anywhere that you can put a water hole, you're going to attract wildlife, not only birds, but everything else. So we have strategically placed water holes throughout the property we, and, uh, and blinds next to those water holes to optimize, you know, afternoon or morning light. We do what we call, what I call shooting lanes where the brush has been pushed back from where the perches that you're going to be set up so you can get good backgrounds when you're photographing, good foregrounds. We build everything with a 500 millimeter lens in mind because most clients will have a four, five, or a six. We build it for a five because a six and a four work, you know. So uh, everything has been built again with photography in mind. Um, the ranch has a guest house, and we're just fin- we're actually comp- trying to finish a new addition to it. Uh, we, uh, we right now we have eight beds. We're going to have sixteen beds here pretty soon, uh, where you can actually stay at the ranch, meal service at the ranch. So you don't have to stay at a hotel in town. You can actually stay on the property itself. Uh, the ranch is very popular in the springtime, which is for for us is from mid February all the way to July Fourth weekend. You have to book at least sixteen months ahead of time. If wow. not, you don't get in. If not, you don't wow. get in. We're that busy. Well, uh, with this new addition that we're doing, it, it's going to help some, but not much because people already know that we're adding. So it's it's we're we're getting booked next year. March, April, and May are sold out already. Um, wow. So that that kind of tells you. Now there are some times like if you do happen to be coming into town, you might call me. Hector is just one. It's just me. I might be able to put you in with some other people and get you in, you know. Uh, but I, I do suggest if you do really want to come to to book, you know, ahead of time. Now that's sure. in the spring, um, uh, and the spring is busier for for multiple reasons. One, the weather is okay. Uh, you know, still mid eighties, low nineties. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hot year round down here. So it's, it's not going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be cool, but it's going to be less hot, I guess, in the spring. And the <laughs> amount of, the amount of species of birds is higher. You know, we have all the South Texas year long species, but we also have what we call our summer residents, painted buntings, grouse beaks, flycatchers, yellow billed cuckoos. You know, we have quite a bit of species that are only here in the spring. In the fall, they're gone down back to Mexico. Um, so spring is busy because of that. Now, our fall season, which is the months of October and November, are also very good. Less species, but a lot of other stuff. We have the big cubbies of quail coming in. The deer start coming in into their, you know, into their nice plumage. Of course, the deer start coming into antlers. Uh, the raptors become very, very active. We have crested caracaras, harris hawks that come a lot to our setups. Um, that becomes very active in the fall. So it's, I would say it's still very good, but not as much in terms of, in other words, still very good, but not as many species as you have in the spring. Now for the fall, if you book two, three months ahead of time, you'll get in, but we do sell out as well. Just not that far ahead. Uh, winter, December, January can be very good, but weather is just a little unpredictable. You know, a cold front comes in and it rains on us. Um, but still good activity. The only times I tell people not to come is from mid July through mid September for two reasons. One in August, it's 113 here with 90% humidity. So (laughs) you don't want to be here at that that time of year. I mean, it's brutally hot, brutally, brutally hot. And number two, the birds are molting. So the birds don't look good. You know, they're, they're doing their yearly molt of feathers. So, Unless you're into naked green jays, don't come in August because the birds look really, really bad. Um, so that's the time of year that we tell clients, you know, this it's just not a good time to come. It's too, too hot for one. And again, the birds don't look good. Uh, yeah. And also, yeah. once it gets that hot, we really don't see much wildlife because wildlife goes nocturnal. You know, they wait for the sun to go down before they start moving because it's just too hot in the middle of the day. Uh, so that time of year, the wildlife activity drops, the birds look good. I mean, don't look good. And again, it's just really hot. Um, but, uh, we offer two types of visits. You know, you can come to the ranch as just a regular visitor, which will put you with a guide. A guide will take you out, take you to the blinds, kind of help you do setups, show you what happens in the morning and afternoons. Or you can also, of course, do our workshops, which are in May. Uh, those are the ones that you see on my website. 
the workshop is kind of also as, as a guided shoot, but of course a lot more intensive. You know, uh, a lot of teaching, you know, the presentations I talked about earlier and what we do in between shoots uh, and all that. Both regular visits and, and workshops, if you want, you know, the workshop, of course, are all inclusive, meal service, everything's included. But on the regular visits, if you do want meal service and you're in a group of three or more, we can provide meals and everything like that for you. And uh, mm -hmm. the information on the ranch, you can, same thing, you can find it on our website. The website is santaclararanch.com. Or you can also go to my website, HectorAstorga.com, and the information on the ranch is there as well. Uh, but if uh, but all the information for the ranch would be on the ranch's website. Uh, to book, just shoot us an email. All the information is on the website. And uh, we send you back basically what's available. And then you just you know pick the dates that you want to come and do a booking. Great. Nice. Great. Now, I know we have, we have quite a few um, friends of the show in Texas that would probably love to come and participate in you know, be able yeah. to do something like that. Yeah. So, And a lot of birders and the opportunity to get some of those species that we don't see in the northern plains, you know, obviously. Oh, no, correct. That is, uh, and even in, you know, Florida is a big birding destination also. But there are species that you don't get in Florida that you guys do in South Texas. That is correct. You know, in terms of wading birds and shorebirds, we're very similar, you know, Florida and Texas. Mm -hmm. Uh, the advantage you're going to have with Florida is that Florida, they're a little bit more habituated to people, I guess. They're not as spooky as our, you know, wading birds are here. But uh, where we are definitely, you know, ahead of, of, of Florida in terms of South Texas is in the songbird, you know, in the number of species of songbirds and the, the other types of birds that we have down here. Uh, there's a lot of South Texas only species that you can only in the only place in the U.S. where you can see them is here. Uh, so we're very unique in that sense. And that's why we're such a big, you know, destination for birders and bird photographers. Well, geez, I just need to save up all my money and start booking tours with you, Hector. <laughs> yeah. How much does it cost for <laughs> the year? Nothing Hector? wrong with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. Too funny. Well, Hector, I greatly appreciate your time this evening and, and want to respect your time. You, uh, you stuck with us through some technical difficulties tonight. Oh, no biggie, guys. But no biggie. It, was, it was definitely worth the wait uh, getting to visit with you. And maybe we'll just take a podcast trip down and and uh, reserve some blinds for a couple of days and have yeah, some fun there in South Texas. That would be fantastic. Yeah. We'd love to have you. Hey, real quick, Ron. Go ahead. Sorry, before we end, I, I just think this will be interesting for the listeners to hear. And it's something Hector and I were talking about right before the show kind of kicked off when we were having our technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. But Hector used to be a Nikon guy. Oh, yeah. Like I think almost like almost everybody <laughs> um, in our, you know, especially you and myself and others. And he's now on the Sony. But I was just curious, Hector, you were telling me a little bit about that story. Maybe you can tell us about kind of you know, the transition you made and what, you know, what caused that. Sure. Thing. Um, when I first got into photography, like I, I said earlier, back in 2006, in the film days, I shot Minolta. My father shot Minolta. So I had a lot of Minolta lenses. When I got serious in 2007 and I bought my first uh, DSLR, the Sony A mount, the Sony A100, the very first DSLR Sony put out, the, their A mount was the same Minolta mount. I don't know if you all remember that. So all my Minolta lenses would fit on the Sony. So that's what I bought. And uh, so when I got started, I shot Sony for three years. I started with the A100, then I got the A900, got some of the G lenses back then. Um, fast forward to 2010, and I really was really getting into this. And at the time, Sony just did not have the lenses for wildlife photographers. They had the bodies, but the lenses were just non-existent. So I was using third-party lenses. I was using, uh, you know, the 150 to 600 type lenses. And I wanted to start shooting with primes. And uh, with Sony, I just couldn't do it. So in 2010, I left Sony and went to Nikon. And then uh, I shot Nikon for 10 years, from 2010 to 2020. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I love my Nikon gear. Uh, I did very well with Nikon. Um, I started, I think, with the D... The D3 was my first, you know, pro body or D3, yes, D3, D3. And uh, I went from D3 to the D4 to the D5. Of course, I had the D850. I had a few of their crop cameras. I'm not a crop camera shooter, so I didn't keep it much because I'm, I'm, I'm primarily a full, a full frame shooter. Um, so, uh, but again, I, I love my Nikon gear. 
I remember when, I think it was in 2016 or around there, when one of my clients showed me the very first mirrorless camera that I ever got to see. I think it was, a, if I remember correctly, I don't remember what it was, but I think it was an Olympus. I, I don't remember what brand it was. But she came up to me and she says, look, Hector, I'm shooting this new Olympus or with this new, again, I'm going to say Olympus. I don't remember the brand. And it's mirrorless. It's the new thing and this and that. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. Can I, can I look at it? And I took a look at that through that viewfinder. And to me, it looked like the 1980s VHS cameras. Remember those that you would put over your shoulder? <laughs> it looked like an old 1970 TV in there. You know, it flickered. There was a lag. And I was like, oh, my God, what is this? And, and you know, and I, you know, I didn't say anything, but I'm thinking to myself, this is definitely not for me. You know, at that time, the electronic viewfinders were just not, up, you know, we're not up to par, right? They still had a long way to go. So back then, I just kind of, completely said, you know, mirrorless is not for me. I'm not doing it. And, you know, years went by. I started doing more trips. I started doing more workshops. You know, let's fast forward now to, you know, 2019, early 2020 before the pandemic hit. And uh, now I'm getting three out of seven clients with a mirrorless camera. 50-50 some trips, you know, half the clients with mirrorless, the other half with DSLRs. And I'm starting to get questions like, Hector, what should we use? Should we use a mechanical shutter or, or electronic shutter? And I'm going, what in the world is he, a mechanical? <laughs> what in the world is an electronic? I mean, again, I did, I just did not know the mirrorless, you know, terminology, the, the mirrorless features, because again, I just hadn't shot with one because I completely avoided them for so many years. So in early 2020, I decided, you know what, in order to be a better guide, a better photo leader, a better instructor, I need to start learning this stuff because I'm getting just way too many clients now shooting mirrorless, you know, 50-50, sometimes more than 50-50. So I bought one uh, and uh, I reached, you know, if I was going to buy one to learn it, I researched what would be a good one for a wildlife photographer. At the time, uh, Nikon did not have a mirrorless camera that was good enough for what I look for. Uh, they had some mirrorless cameras, you know, the Z line, but they, you know, when I looked at the specs and when I looked what they could do, they were, they're, they're not the camera I like to use, you know, they were just not there. So I looked at the other ones and I like what Sony had to offer. So I said, you know what, I'll buy a Sony. So I bought a, the Sony a 92 and I bought their two to 600 lens. Uh, and that my, my plan was to shoot this next to my lineup of, you know, Nikon, just to learn it, just to be able to be, you know, more versed in mirrorless technology or kind of not sound like a dummy when people are asking me questions and I have no idea what they're asking me about. You know, because photography is photography, right? In terms of exposure, you know, you know, the photography triangle and all that. But uh, I was getting questions that I couldn't answer when it came to mirrorless stuff. And that's why I bought it. So I bought it and then the pandemic hit. And of course... All trips postponed or canceled. Everybody coming to the ranch canceled. We actually shut down the ranch. So in a way for me, the pandemic was kind of good in, in, because I got to go out to photograph for myself with no clients for the first time in maybe you know eight years that I actually had the ranch all to myself. And I photographed the way I like to photograph. I'm very target specific. When I go for something, I go for just that, which I cannot do when I'm with clients, right? When I'm with clients, it's more of a general all around. Um, and since I had this new camera and this new lens, I said, you know what? I'm going to really play with this thing. And I started really playing with it. And I'd be honest with you, at first, I did not like it. I was like, I couldn't get used to the, the to the EVF, the electronic viewfinder. Stuff was flying out on me. I couldn't track stuff. Uh, but the more and the more I used it, the more I started liking it. So this was in March when the pandemic hit. So March, April, May, June. By the time we get to June, I realized I haven't touched my Nikons in four months. <laughs> you know, I've been shooting with this only for four months straight. And I'm really liking it. Uh, I'm liking the fact that I have a, a live histogram in the EVF. I'm liking the fact that when I change my f-stop, I see what's happening to my background and my foreground. I'm seeing my depth of field in real time. I'm liking the fact that the focusing system with this tracking stuff is phenomenal. So I said, you know what? I want a prime lens. I want to get a prime lens with this stuff. Because if I'm really liking it with this small 2 to 6, what can I do with a 6 f4, you know, 600 f4? Now, 
I cannot afford to have a full lineup. Of, I couldn't have a full lineup of Sony. Um, so I basically one day sat down and just said, you know, what do I do? Do I want to keep shooting DSLRs or do I want to switch to full mirrorless? Because I want to be able to start using this new technology with with prime lenses, you know. But I cannot afford to have both. You know, I have to. I'm, I'm going to have to pick one. And I decided to switch, and so I switched over to you know went back to Sony. Now for me it was a little bit easier because a lot of people talk about the Sony menus and how complicated they are. But to me it was easy because remember I shot Sony for three years and the menus are very similar to what we had you know back in 2006 to 2010. So to me the switch was easy. Now I did not leave Nikon because I was unhappy with what they had to offer. They just didn't have what I wanted at the time. And uh, so that's kind of how I jumped back, you know, back to Sony and how I went, you know, to the mirrorless technology. Now with the new A1 that's come out and uh, I'm shooting this, their 600 F4, that's my main lens now. Uh, it's, um, I'm extremely happy with the results, what I'm getting, what, you know, what, 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 this, what this new camera can do. Uh, so it's, it's been, it's been good. It's been a good year. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I just wanted to touch on that because I know I, I run into so many people in the field and. A lot of people ask about these these this very question, these very issues. So I'm thanks for sharing that with us, Hector. And you know, that's something that a lot of folks are struggling with right now is what decision to make and which way to go. So you know, I, I always tell my clients, ask yourself three questions. One, are you happy with the results that you're getting? Two, are you physically able to handle your gear? And three, the most important one, are you having fun? And if the answer to those three questions is yes, maybe switching is not there for you yet. Now, of course, as to, you know, the mirrorless is the hot thing now. So a lot, you know, the you know the big camera companies are going to start putting in their greatest and best technology into the mirrorless. So yes, eventually you're going to have if you want to keep up with the newer technology, the new focusing systems, the the, the better sensors the you're going to have to switch because that's where the technologies, you know, that's where the companies are going for. That's where they're going to put their eggs in. They're going to put their eggs in their new mirrorless uh, technology. So eventually, yes, you're going to have to switch. Now, is it time to switch like right right now? Again, ask yourself those three questions. And if the answer is yes, maybe not. Maybe you're not ready. Um, um, you know, because I get questions all the time. Should I switch? Should I change this? And I said, are you happy with what you have? Yes. Are you getting the results? Yes. And are you physically able to, you know, handle the big lenses? Yes. And why, why switch? <laughs> you know, it, it's working for you. It, you know, um, and of course, the other thing, of course, is the financial aspect of it. You know, you know, how much is it going to cost you to, to, to switch when you have a full lineup of one system versus going to another one? Um, I like that these companies leapfrog each other. You know, for example, in mirrorless, Sony has been ahead of the curve for many years. But Canon is right at their footsteps right now, right? You know, knocking knocking on their door. And Nikon is a little behind, but I'm sure they'll catch up. And I like that these companies leapfrog each other because that means good technology for all of us, regardless of what system you shoot, you know. Right. Uh, because once one comes up with one, the other one's right behind it, you know. And uh, these companies are going to just start leapfrogging each other. And that's good for all of us, regardless of what you shoot. Um, and I always tell everybody, you know, what I, the way I shoot is different than what you shoot. So I'm never going to tell you, oh, that's not good or anything like that. Because for you, that might be perfect. Just because it's not good for me, it doesn't mean it's not good for somebody else. Yeah. So. See, look at that. Ended on a pro tip. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. Three questions. <laughs> Excellent. Well, again, thank you, Hector. My pleasure, guys. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for listening to another episode of Wild and Exposed Podcast. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed Podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna make it someday Nothing's gonna get in our way